Hi. Hello. How are you, weird friends? Welcome back to my podcast. If you are new, this is a true crime podcast hosted by yours truly, where I discuss each week a murder case that has sparked interest in myself or one of my listeners. Some of these cases are solved, cold, or still under investigation. So if you have a murder suggestion you would like featured in an upcoming episode, be sure to go follow me on social media and shoot me a message. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Pocketful of Crime. So I'm a member on a ton of Facebook sleuth groups. So my news feed is constantly full of missing persons and unsolved murders and some small cases that are pleading for exposure and answers. And I ran across this week's case last week and it's a murder I'm familiar with. I've listened to it on a few fellow true crime podcasts, at least two different ones. And we just passed the anniversary of this case on January 11th. So this case is going on seven years now being unsolved and unresolved for the family. And I say unresolved because this case never was ruled a homicide, charges were never granted, and an investigation was never fully executed. The family refused to take accidental death for an answer, and I'll explain why. This is the murder of Kendrick Johnson. This week, we are taken to Valdosta, Georgia. Valdosta, Georgia is right inside Lowndes County, only 15 miles north of the Florida state line and 230 miles south of Atlanta. Valdosta is the 14th largest city in Georgia with estimated population in 2018 at 56,426. Valdosta is home to local Valdosta High School, which has a football program with the most wins of any other high school in the United States. They love their football. Median annual income is 32,000 rounded up, leaving 28% of its population under the poverty line. The median home value in Valdosta is 96,000. Only 37% of its population are homeowners, leaving 62% renters and 14% vacant. Average monthly rent in Valdosta is running $1,015. Let me introduce you to Kendrick Johnson, the victim in this week's case. Kendrick Johnson was born October 10th, 1995 to Kenneth and Jackie Johnson. He was described by family and friends as being a good person He was a great athlete and played several sports, but specifically wanted to become a professional football player. He was only 18 years old when he passed away. Kendrick attended Valdosta High School, even played on that football team I just mentioned. January 10th, 2013, Kendrick's mother, Jackie, grew worried when her son didn't come home from a basketball game he was expected to attend. Jackie called Kendrick's cell phone numerous times with no answer. She even drove by the school around midnight to look for any sign of Kendrick with no luck. Jackie filed a missing persons report with police immediately. The next morning, January 11th, she arrived at the school's counselor's office searching for answers of her son's whereabouts. While inside, 
school counselor's office is when Jackie was greeted with the devastating news her son's lifeless body had just been discovered inside the school's gymnasium. Kendrick Johnson's body was discovered by fellow classmates when they described seeing what looked like socks sticking out from the top of a vertical rolled up wrestling mats. They climbed up on the mats thinking it was a prank only to discover it was in fact a body face down unresponsive in this vertical rolled up wrestling mat. The students immediately called for help. The mat was too heavy to lay down by themselves. That is when the gruesome discovery and condition of the body was revealed. Police arrived and identified the body as Kendrick Johnson. Within 24 hours of the body being discovered, the manner of death was ruled as accidental by positional asphyxia, which means he was head down. The blood rushed and pooled in his head. He couldn't move or climb out of the mat, resulting in lack of oxygen, resulting in death. Kendrick was found without shoes, and the explanation was offered up that he must have climbed up onto the mat to search and reached down inside one of the mats to receive a pair of shoes and fell inside and couldn't get back out. This is when things get a little sticky. I wouldn't be covering this case if it was that simple. Case closed. Some students stated it wasn't uncommon for other students to store their gym shoes behind or inside the wrestling mats. Either no gym lockers were available or just to save money on renting one. One student claimed he and Kendrick shared a pair of Adidas sneakers and Kendrick, after gym class, would climb up on the wrestling mats and drop the shoes inside. In the picture of the now laid down gym mat before being unrolled shows Kendrick's feet wearing only socks sticking out, but with a pair of shoes laid next to his feet inside the mat positioned behind his legs, his knees, if he were laid up vertically, which was how he was found. What caught my eye is the shoes weren't Adidas. They were white and orange Nikes. There was one black sneaker found under the head, which could explain what and if he was reaching for a shoe. However, there was a pool of blood found underneath Kendrick's head. Not uncommon, especially being in the upside down position, his blood rushed to his head, and once his heart stopped pumping blood, his facial orifices expelled blood, causing that pool of blood. The shoe discovered beneath him was set on top of the blood pool, as if it was placed on top. His body position was one arm extended above him, and the other down to his side. The mat measured six feet tall, three foot wide, and when rolled up, it only leaves a 14 inch diameter opening at the top. Kendrick's shoulders measured 19 inches across, and he was five foot 10 inches tall. This raised the question if his size even made it possible to fall in or squeeze inside of a mat or if he was rolled up into it. In my mind, I thought, well, if he did in fact squeeze in there to reach a shoe, it would have been a tight and uncomfortable fit. Wouldn't you squeeze back out once you got to a certain point before getting stuck and just push the mat over to receive a shoe? Also, if he did get stuck and yelled for help, how did a school of 3,000 students not hear anything, especially with surveillance footage of students in and out of the school gym constantly. This factor and the size of Kendrick further pushed his parents to believe this was no accident at all. Kendrick's body had a total of three autopsies performed and was exhumed for a private autopsy. The first autopsy results were ruled accidental asphyxia, but the Johnsons weren't sold. They hired a private pathologist to perform a second autopsy. The second autopsy came to completely different conclusions. 
This pathologist concluded the cause of death was result from blunt force trauma to the left soft tissue in Kendrick's neck. But that's not the only shocking discovery that was made. The independent autopsy revealed Kendrick's organs were missing, and the body was stuffed with crumpled newspaper. The body was initially processed by the coroner's office, then released to the funeral home. The funeral home stated the body was not received by them with the organs intact. The organs were said to have been destroyed and discarded through natural process before being transferred to the funeral home. The family filed a complaint against the funeral home administration, but they were initially cleared from any wrongdoing. It was said they didn't follow, quote, best practice. However, filling a void in a body to make a corpse appear better for a funeral isn't the uncommon part. Most funeral homes have better resources to use, such as cotton or even sawdust. Newspaper is a little insensitive and not the best material of choice. November of 2013, 290 hours of surveillance footage from 35 cameras inside the school were released to CNN following a court request. A forensic analyst enlisted by CNN found that the tapes from two surveillance cameras were missing. One hour, five minutes of footage was missing from one, and two hours and ten minutes missing from the other. There were some time lapses discovered from some camera systems that weren't synchronized, and some timestamps were off as much as 20 minutes from the same time period. Even with that explanation, this only raises more question of if it was tampered with and by who. Of course, where Kendrick's body was discovered wasn't in range of surveillance footage. Funny how that always happens, or... Was it intentional? Johnson's family attorney expressed fears that the camera footage was edited and a part of a cover-up. The Lowndes County Sheriff's Office stated, quote, we never had credible information that indicated this was anything other than an accident. The Johnson family also had reason to believe the body was moved from its initial location. The state of Georgia and many states for that matter, require the coroner's office to be notified immediately upon discovery of a body. And the coroner's office wasn't alerted until six hours after the body was discovered. There was also blood found on the wall nearby where the body was found. It was tested, but didn't come back to be a match of Kendrick's. They never did identify whose blood it was. Seems like something you would want to find out when finding a dead body nearby. The parents argued their son's case wasn't taken seriously because of his race. Kendrick was African American, and the county sheriff Chris Prines and all of his investigators were white. The Johnson's attorney stated racism in Valdosta, Georgia was still very much alive, and if Kendrick would have been white, his case would have been handled very differently. The family actually released a photo of Kendrick lying on a funeral home table to the media to draw attention to this matter. Kendrick's face was unrecognizably swollen. Clearly from hanging upside down, his face and head would be swollen, but these pictures were so graphic. It looked like he had been beaten. I want to add a disclosure that if you look up the name or case, the pictures will pop up automatically regardless of desire to see them. Trust me, I sprung upon them by pure surprise and they are very gruesome and very uncomfortable to look at, just so you're aware. And because I know some of your first reactions will be to go Google them right after I said pictures. In 2014, the parents of Kendrick filed a wrongful death suit against the school officials alleging Kendrick was harassed by a student and the school neglected the issue and any punishment. A magazine article surfaced from ebony.com and they described the murder of Kendrick to have been at the hands of two white brothers and fellow students. The names of the two brothers weren't released, however, the description led suspicion right to Brian and Brandon Bell. Possible motive was due to a fight that had taken place 
a year before, but had escalated over time. It was never confirmed exactly what the fight was over. Rumor had it, it was a quarrel over an interest in the same girl. The accused brother's father was actually an FBI agent at the time of the murder. So it raised even more doubt and question of a possible cover-up. The parents argued the murder was covered up by this FBI agent father manipulating the school and even authorities involved to protect his sons. The Johnson family filed a $100 million lawsuit against 38 individuals, accusing two of the fellow students and respondents involved of conspiracy to cover up a murder. The lawsuit was eventually dropped, and a judge ordered the Johnson family and their attorney to pay $292,000 in legal fees to the defendants. The judge accused the family and the family's attorney of fabricating evidence. I don't know, you guys. I'm definitely still on the fence. I've not been yet convinced to pick one side. I definitely smell something fishy, but there's just no damning evidence to support this theory yet. And I say yet because there is still hope that this family will find answers that they are looking for and get some closure so they can finally properly grieve their loss. My thoughts and prayers go out to the Johnson's family. What a tragic, tragic story. That wraps up this week's episode. I hope you all enjoyed this week. Thank you for sticking around and continuing to listen each week. I appreciate you all. Don't forget, the best form of support is by simply hitting that share button. Share my content with your family and friends. The more listeners, the more sponsors, and the more sponsors, the more content I'm able to provide you. Hope you all have an amazing rest of your week. Until next time, stay weird, my friends. Oh, and one more thing.